all of your focus is on that person, right? All of your mental energy, your emotional energy, everything is expounded on to this person when you're in that type of a situation. And then you get out of it. And then you go down the rabbit hole of narcissism and you're looking up everything like, what's a narcissist? So does this like look at their behaviors, the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist. And it's like you went from one obsession to the other. Like it's still all about them. And it's never about you because it wasn't about you in the relationship. And now the relationship is over. It's still all about them. Hey, today's guest is a licensed clinical professional counselor. You can find her on Psychology Today, one of my favorite websites. And she's a relationship trauma expert, speaker, and brain spotting clinician. Brave Hearts community, let's show some love to Tierra Faulkner. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited today. For sure. There's so much stuff I want to talk to you about. We're going to talk about narcissism. <laughs> We're going to talk about red flags and relationships and all that other good stuff. But I want to ask you, this is for me. I want to know. So Brave Hearts community, I know you are excited, but I have a question I want to ask myself. A brain spotting clinician, can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, so brain spotting is similar to EMDR in a way where it utilizes your eye movement as a way to help process trauma. So I kind of like to explain it like to try to break it down. Like when we're just having conversation, we're living our just regular day-to-day -day life we're using like the outer kind of part of our brain. Usually we're just us to function, but where our trauma lives, where some things that are taking place is kind of, it's in the middle. It's like the subcortical or it's like the, the brain. And that means we're not really digging aside, but it's basically that the middle part of the brain that we don't typically access just doing our regular day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so what brain spotting does, it helps access that part of the brain to help our brains internally process trauma or really hard events that is more difficult maybe to try to process using our outer part of the brain. Mm, interesting. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. Because I, I love psychology, even though I'm not as brilliant as you are and I don't have the degrees like you do, but I love psychology. And when I seen that, I was like, okay, because I, I myself, I went to, I did EMDR myself. So uh, got a lot of revelation from it. A lot of things I realized I need to work on. I was just like, oh, this this is this works, you know, so uh, it is pretty good. Uh, so if how do you feel that? Should when do you feel like people should take EMDR like? Mm -hmm. When go ahead. Yeah, yeah. When, um, you know, whether it's like EMDR brain spotting, typically, you know, if you have some trauma, um, if you have maybe an incident or event that happened to you that maybe it's difficult to process through versus like talk therapy, which can still be helpful. But, um, you know, if you're having trouble processing through um, some some events or past traumas, it can be helpful. Um even if you're dealing with, you know, some anxiety or depression, I know sometimes that can also just be helpful if you've just had like a stressful event happen to you. Um, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I don't hear as many talk, as many people talk about EMDR as they should. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we kind of just stop at the therapy, but I do recommend EMDR too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a really powerful tool for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So Brave Arts community, that was for me. So we can get to the rest of the interview now. <laughs> uh, we talked about, uh, I looked at one of your reels because you have some great reels, by the way. I went through all your reels and there was so much stuff I wanted to talk to you about. So I'm going to eventually have to bring you back because I'm like, oh, I want this one. I want this one. So you talked about red flags and tolerating them and why do people overlook them or even tolerate red flags can you break that down for me mm -hmm. yeah so a lot of times like I hear this a lot with my clients or just people my friends all this stuff you know they're like well why do I keep attracting the same people like it's the same people wrapped in different skin it's just I'm dealing with the same issues it's just in a different body 
And I'm like, well, is it that you're attracting these red flaggy people or are you ignoring some stuff? Are you letting people overstay in your life? Mm -hmm. And it kind of got me thinking about what is it that we tolerate? And I got like three reasons why maybe we might tolerate some red flags or ignore some things. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather deal with the devil you know than the one you don't. Meaning you can deal with somebody who's emotionally unavailable. They're inconsistent in their communication. They're a little shady. Okay, you you got that's comfortable for you versus, well, somebody else might be worse. And you don't want to take a chance on that. And sometimes we don't even recognize that, right? So these might even be things that you're aware of or you might not even be aware of. It might be in your subconscious. Number two, you'd rather deal with the devil you know than to be alone. Because being alone means I have to deal with myself. I got to deal with me and all of my stuff. So I'd rather deal with their stuff than my own. And that's hard. That's scary. Like, uh-uh, I don't want to sit with myself and my thoughts and my emotions and all of my stuff. Like, no, what's wrong with them? What's going on with them? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Let me put my focus over there. And number three, you'd rather deal with the devil you know than to actually step into what it's like to have healthy. And that one's layered because... I'll have my clients and even my friends like, imagine, can you imagine what it'd be like for you to be in a healthy relationship with someone? That's scary. That's scary for a lot of people because it's uncomfortable. It brings up this discomfort. And then the other layer beneath that is, I don't think I'm worthy of healthy. I don't think that healthy belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And that'll leave you tolerating things that you know doesn't align with you, but it's better than nothing. So you'll stick with that. Mm. Yeah, I I totally agree. And it's sad because a lot of people get used to dysfunction and drama where it just becomes normal. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know that it's, it's normal. It's just like, this is just what I deal with now. And it has become their world. And so, like you said, when you have a healthy relationship, I, uh, a lot of times you hear people like, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know, uh, which is unfortunate. And the shoe will drop because we all <laughs> we all have hang ups. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that. When you do deserve healthy love, when you feel like you deserve better, you you will choose better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about narcissism. Because I hear that this is such a buzzword in today's culture. I hear it all the time. I get DMs and, and people will say, I broke up with him because he was a narcissist. She, I broke up with her because she was a narcissist. Can you give me your definition of narcissism? And let's let's just kind of debunk that a little more. Like, let's, let's really dig into that because I need some help understanding this because everybody's talking about it. <sighs> <laughs> dreaded narcissism okay so narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosis that is in the dsm right it is in its cluster b of personality disorders and it's usually classified by someone who feels superior to other people they have this grandiose view of themselves and what they deserve and oftentimes they lack empathy. And so, you know, as a result, they're not treating people the best typically, but oftentimes, which I don't really think is talked about enough is a lot of times with personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. These are all the personality disorders in that cluster B because a lot of times there is a trauma root somewhere in childhood. 
So there is some psychological wounding as to why that person might be the way that they are. Um, but that's kind of, that's the narcissistic personality disorder in a nutshell, which is rare, but also people who may have narcissistic personality disorder might not recognize that they need some sort of help or support. Um, so it might go undiagnosed. And then there are people with narcissistic traits where they may exhibit certain behaviors that, you know, maybe they're manipulative, they're entitled, they have, you know, this sense of, this grandiose sense of self, but they don't have narcissistic personality disorder. And so, you know, if you have an ex or partner who cheats on you a lot, they might not be a narcissist. They might just be a cheater, right? But so, yeah. <laughs> I, I get it, right? I totally understand. It's just that everyone uses it so much that I'm like, well, if that's the case, we're all narcissists then, right? I think, you know, if you if you have some some confidence about yourself, if you say you deserve better, people call you a narcissist because they look at you yeah. like, well, you know, like you think you're better than me, you're a narcissist. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> right, it's definitely, I think it's being overused in a, in a sense, but it's... Um, you know, I like to kind of be able to shift the focus a little bit because oftentimes like, okay, let's say you were in a situation where you were dealing with a narcissist, someone with narcissistic personality disorder or just narcissistic traits, or, you know, they were emotionally abusive in some way. And maybe in that relationship, all of your focus is on that person all of your mental energy, your emotional energy, everything is expounded on to this person when you're in that type of a situation. And then you get out of it. And then you go down the rabbit hole of narcissism and you're looking up everything, like what's a narcissist? What is this? Like, look at their behaviors, the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist. And it's like, you went from one obsession to the other. Like, it's still all about them. And it's never about you because it wasn't about you in the relationship. And now the relationship is over. It's still all about them. And so that's where I'm kind of like, okay, like, yes, it's helpful to identify some behaviors, acknowledge, you know, your experience or what you went through. But okay, once we've identified, okay, what this was, now what? Now you have to take a look in yourself. And, co and it kind of goes back to, what was I drawn to about this person beginning? What red flags did I, did I miss, did I ignore, did I tolerate? What was it about me that was, that was drawn to this? And how can I not, how can I avoid going down that same road again with someone else? But I have to look at myself, right? I have to do the healing work. Now I got to heal from the wounds of this relationship and look at the impact of how did this change the view of myself and the world around me. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's still requiring you to take a deeper inner look with yourself. But when we are so caught up in, well, I think my ex was a narcissist and we're we're on YouTube, we're on TikTok, we're looking at everything. Narcissists, 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 narcissists. Like we we feed that obsession, right? But it's still about them. Mm. So that's that's my take. Is you know, I like to challenge, I like to say, okay, well, hold on, wait a minute. What are we doing? How is this helping us? So <laughs> no that's good i i love it because and the reason i asked you that was again it's a buzzword but there's so i mean you have 12 year old kids talking about my ex was a narcissist 
they like 12, 13, talking to him. Just like, at 13, he was gaslighting me. I'm like, yeah, 13. No shade to, to, the, to the kids, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, it gets heavy. It gets heavy. It looks like, hold on, wait a minute. We don't have to <laughs> get clear on the language sometimes. It's, it's, it's a lot, but I'm glad you cleared the air because uh, I want to get some clarity on that to help my folks out. Mm -hmm. I was looking at one of your reels, as usual. And you talked about the grief process that comes with the ending of a traumatic or toxic relationship. Why is it so many people don't take time to grieve? Now, that's a word we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we really don't talk about that a lot. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Like the feeling of loss or abandonment that we might have after relationship, even if it was unhealthy or traumatic or toxic, when we avoid that grief process, we'll jump into the next thing. And then we might even go back to that person. We'll go from relationship to relationship to avoid that pain. And, you know, and nobody likes to feel that. Nobody wants to grieve. Nobody wants to, you know, be upset about it but what I've also found too like if the relationship has been traumatic and there's been layers of betrayal there's been layers of you know infidelity or abuse in that relationship there's a lot of judgment um that comes from society from even just our own internal voice um that comes with some shame of wow, like, I'm upset that this is over. I'm sad that this is over, even though this was not, not healthy. And there, there's this internal shame that can exist when we have these complicated feelings about something that was unhealthy for us. But I want to be able to validate that experience because, you know, people don't come, you know, in all bad. You know, they don't come with, hey, look, I'm the villain, you know, well, not on their forehead, right? Like people are very complex. And, you know, the person that maybe was doing the betraying is probably filled with a lot of gray. There was probably layers of nurture in that relationship, moments when they showed up, moments when they, you know, showed love and compassion, that those were those moments that you clinged on to, not necessarily the ones where they were doing the hurt, right? And so when we allow ourselves to be able to give ourselves some grace to, to grieve, right? Grace to grieve something that even if it was unhealthy. And so, because that's something for us, that's something for us to give to ourselves, right? To not neglect ourselves in that way and say, yeah, no, I need to feel these feelings. I need to work through this process. I need to understand what this was and how I can move forward so I can have better. So I can believe I can have better. And so, you know, being able to not necessarily avoid that pain and the shame that comes with that and being able to allow ourselves the space, the grace, to grieve and the compassion and the nurture that we didn't maybe get in that relationship or childhood or whatever the case is and shut out all the outside noise of what your friends might think or how we our friends or family might think we should feel right because our friends and family be like well you know that wasn't good for you anyway why are you upset like they did you so dirty um you should be jumping for joy right now and we all was sitting there like I'm I'm actually hurt like I'm actually not okay right but those messages even though they're maybe they don't intend to cause harm or whatever but it does leave some feelings of shame if we're like oh dang should I be upset this is over should I be should I be crying in the middle of the night should I be thinking about this person and after they did me dirty after they treated me so poorly but it's like it wasn't just it wasn't all that right like it was all bad we probably wouldn't be there that long you know what I mean it was there's some nuance there's some layers there's some gray and so when we're able to 
acknowledge that and lean into that and say, yeah, you know what? I have a right to grieve. I have a right to feel through my feelings and work through it and give myself that so I can heal. And so I can have better relationships. Mm -hmm. I like what you said. You said the grace to grieve. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. That's, that's, that's a tweet. I'll give you uh, the credit for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good because we, again, we we throw around the word narcissism around a lot, but we don't use words like grief and, you know, things of that nature because um, understanding loss. There's a book I'm listening to on Audible now called, uh, it's called Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud. Mm. Really good. And he's talking about how in order for something to grow, something has to die first. And very few of us know how to make that transition of, because a lot of times we're always trying to pull things with us, take everything with us, but we we rarely unpack things. We're always packing, but never unpack. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually it gets too heavy for us. And that's when we realize that we have to let something go. But mm -hmm. it's so much stuff that we've taken with us, we don't know what to unpack. Mm -hmm. So uh, It's a really good book, though. Really good book. I want to have a bonus round with you now. This is something that I ask all of our guests on the show. So there's no right or wrong answer. I'd just like to know your thought process on these. Number one, what is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Mm. <laughs> okay, okay. The biggest mistake I see women make in relationships. Ah. <sighs> I would probably say too much emphasis on the other person. I would say uh -huh. that. Yeah, let's talk about it. Is where it gets to the point where it's all consuming. And it's like, you know, you know, maybe every time you get on the phone with that friend, it's like all they have to talk about is their guy or what happened with them. You know, when it's like they're, when everything is kind of about this person, what they did, what they didn't do, what they said, what they didn't say, um, it's kind of like, okay, we can acknowledge what's happening here, but what about you? Where are you in, in this equation? What are some other things going on in your life that are interesting to you, that bring you joy? Um, there tends to be some neglect of self when the relationship becomes all consuming. And I see that a lot with women. Um, and, you know, but I think, you know, women love hard. Women are naturally nurturers, you know, they give a lot. But I think sometimes it's important to recognize that nature and being able to put the brakes somewhere because we don't want to forget about ourselves and we don't want to lose ourselves in a relationship. And so really it's about finding this balance between, you know, paying attention, being present in a relationship, but also giving room to other parts of ourselves, right? Like we're made up of all these different parts and interests and things that make up who we are. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we will push aside all of that for this relation, the, now this relationship is all consuming, it's all, it's all in mind. And I say, one thing I say, like if you're a person who journals and if every journal entry or a good majority of that journal entry starts with their name, that's something to pay attention to, <laughs> right? Cause that's, that, that proves a pattern somewhere. But every time you open your journal, it's so-and-so, so-and-so, next journal entry, so-and-so, so and so, it's like, what about your good days? Why didn't you write about your good days? Why mm -hmm. didn't you write about the thing that happened at work or your family or something else, right? When it's very much centered, when the relationship takes place in the center, when the relationship ends somehow, divorce, breakup, and now you're left trying to figure out who you are 
we're, who are you? And I find that a lot with women is this sense of losing the identity in a relationship. And I think being able to be intentional about where we put our, our energy and our time and our thought space, like really paying attention, like where is the majority of my thought space on this man or is it also on other things that I, that I like? What are your interests? What are your hobbies? What are things you like to do by yourself? Or do you like to go with your friends? Do you travel? Like, what what are some other things that can fill up your thought space? Because if it's all about that person, that can get to a kind of a scary place if the relationship were to end, because now you're having to pick up some pieces and figure out who you are and go down that journey. And that's not an easy one um to go down and so being able to maintain a healthy balance um being able to hold to your identity and still grow in your identity while being in a relationship you know it's definitely possible to do um but yeah but I find that going down that slippery slope of of all consuming um is something I see a lot Mm -hmm. that's good I never thought about that about the journal being Every page is about Leroy. Every 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 page is about Ken. Every page is about Andre. Every that's that's interesting. Good stuff. I uh do you know who she's a business coach? Do you know who know who Donnie Wiggins is? That name sounds familiar. You have you heard Social Proof Podcast? That sounds familiar to me. Yeah, David Shans. But Anyway, shout out to them. Love them from afar. Donnie was saying one day that in her journal, not only does she journal about things that's going on as far as like issue wise, but like what are solutions? Like she liked to journal solution wise. Mm. It's kind of it being a blame session. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's important to be able to acknowledge that and be able to write about other things. I always tell my clients too, like journal about your good days. Like you had a good day, write about that too. It's not always about, you know, the bad days or, you know, this thing happened, that thing happened. Be like, you know what, today I had some peace. And so like maybe the days that you don't, you can go back to that and say, yeah, I can get back to this good day. I know it's possible for me to get back to whatever I was feeling on this day because we tend to forget. You know, we tend to forget sometimes those days we just, we had peace or we had a really good day or we enjoyed going to see our friend or getting outside or whatever the case is. Um, but sometimes it can serve as like a positive reminder when we are able to look back at that. Mm-hmm. So what are some things that brings you joy? Um, things that bring me joy. Um, I was with my dog, for sure. My dog, Pepper, she's a husky and I love her so, so much um my family my friends being able to see them um being able to travel like I love just seeing new places trying new food um those are all things that I enjoy that's cool that's cool I'm glad that you talked about not losing yourself especially for women even like with married women right that's a big issue for married women you get caught up in your your husband and your kids and all these other things. So one thing I've learned over time is I say to my wife, I, I don't ask her all the time, but when we kind of have a pillow talk, I was just say, what's one thing you've done for yourself today? And by doing so, that allows her to put the focus back on her mm-hmm. and to know that everything isn't about us, you know, me and the boys and stuff like that. So uh, it just helps to recenter her sometimes when I ask her. Yeah, that's definitely helpful. I definitely know because, you know, I was married. But I know, like, how a lot of things I speak on, too, it's professional experience, but it's also personal, too. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, being able to just come back to self is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I want to talk about this real quick since we're here. Mm-hmm. Because I was married for 15 years before I went through my divorce, Right. 
And the Brave Hearts community, they know my story, but sometimes I like to talk about it with guests and stuff like that, just in case if you haven't heard the episode, you might have missed it. But that was one thing that my ex-wife, she always made sure that everybody else was taken care of except for her. And trying to get get her to do something for herself could be challenging at times because it's like how do you get somebody to come out of that space to where they start to find themselves again like is that something that your spouse can help you with or is that do they have to come to their own to their own realization Mm. that's a good one because like we talk about like a sense of motivation yeah like, what's the mm-hmm. motivation to for them to say okay i'm gonna take care of myself today i'm gonna shift focus to them and or just you know to, to themselves and so you know your spouse can be helpful to point that out i'm saying hey like i noticed that you are always giving around here why don't you you know take a day for yourself or or do something right but you know that might also sometimes come with some resistance um, from someone who is so used to giving and so used to kind of neglecting themselves in a way um so it might take some pushing sometimes Mm -hmm. but sometimes it does they just kind of sometimes like with any type of change there's got to be a level of readiness for it Mm -hmm. and a level of motivation for change and so for them, to, for that person to recognize and say, okay, I guess I'll, I'll go do something for myself. I guess I'll try to shift into that. Like they've got to come to a place of readiness for that themselves. A push can be helpful. Push can always be helpful. But they also have to get to that place of being intentional about maybe not neglecting parts of themselves anymore and giving themselves, so, giving to themselves in a different way than maybe they haven't before. Mm-hmm. Um you know, sometimes that's hard when, especially when we're in a pattern of always overextending and overgiving and over caring, you know, for everyone else, it can, um, it can be difficult for someone to say, yeah, I'm going to choose myself and not see it as selfish. Right. Cause that's trying to un reframe that belief. <laughs> it's so hard for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I asked you, because some people find value in that. They find value in taking care of other people. Like it makes them feel important. Mm -hmm. So that can be a kind of a inner turmoil when you're trying to help them to want to do for themselves. But they like I find my value in helping other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it can be a lot. And then, you know, being able to reframe that. And, you know, like, yeah, we can give to other people, right? But it's also like, okay, at some point, you've got to realize if you don't give to yourself, you won't have anything left to give to other people like you want to. And so I think it's a lot for people that like, you know, they're, they're just naturally nurturers or naturally, you know, warm giving people and they want to keep giving. But it's like, you know, at some point, um, you know, you're going to burn out. You're going to be so poured out you have nothing left and so it's like what what's wrong with pouring into yourself so you can keep pouring out right because finding that healthy balance and so being able to reframe what it means to be selfish and like when kind of just dispelling that idea that the minute I pour into myself and take some time and pour some energy into me that I'm being selfish right and it's like can it still just be let me pour into me so I can keep doing what I what I do in a way of giving can I pour into myself just so I can be okay can I just like can it just does it have to be selfish like that's a big word so like kind of being able to reframe some of these things because there's nothing wrong with tending to self right like we we're meant to exist right we're here for a reason and so being able to say yeah let me keep being here let me keep doing what I do so I gotta take time for myself like it's a must right like 
being able to change what that means um, and just reframing this this whole idea of, of selfishness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good because we talk about it, but I don't think we talk about it enough, especially for women. Um, since we're here, I guess I got to ask you this. There was a question I seen on social media. Well, it was a video. I don't know if it went viral, but there was a lady that said she would rather have she would rather cater to to her child opposed to a husband. And it caused this big debate kind of thing, right? And I was just thinking like is that is that more of a trauma response or do you believe most women think like that like if they just had to choose well i think i have to define cater to mm. however however you define cater. But i mean because i mean if it's like okay i'm rather i'm not catered to my i'd rather cater to my child than my husband it's kind of like what does that mean like feeding them making sure they're mm. okay nurturing them talking to them you know that kind of thing and it's and that's 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 interesting yeah. um that's a really interesting dynamic because you know well why why do we have to choose between the two I want I'd want to know that why is there a um one or the other that's interesting to me um and what would be wrong with a sense of nurture to your husband or just being there just making sure he's okay or just you know that kind of thing so that I don't know I'd be curious the person who asked the question or you know or who's made that statement because um what is that about like what is that what what's going on there like I'd be curious to know like where's the resistance in in providing a sense of nurture to the husband and why is the child, um, why is there a comparison? Because that's different, right? Like your yeah. your child and your spouse, and there's a difference in, in the dynamic between the two. And, you know, as a wife, you know, you're caring for both in some capacity. You're going to care for your child. You're going to care for your husband. Your husband's going to care for you, I would, I would hope so. And he's going to care for the child as well. So, you know, it brings up this idea of, you know, why are, why are we having to choose um, who we provide nurture to? And then um, where's the resistance and why is the child involved in the dynamic between, mm. the, you know? Like, as if I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. You're the first person that I asked this because it's been brewing for a while. Matter of fact, if you get a chance, it's on my page. Okay, I'm gonna check it. Yeah, that's interesting. I would want to know where that's coming from. Um, and and yeah, cause that's that sounds like there's something there for that to even be, you know, a thing. And I'd be curious to like unpack that um, pro that thinking process, cause I'd be like, hmm, there's there's something there with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there, yeah, the comments were crazy. So whenever you get a chance, check it out. Um, there was something else that I wanted to ask you about that. I think it, I think it started with single moms being the single parent households being the number one. That's the nuclear family by today's standards. The, or not the nuclear, but the the standard family now are single parent homes opposed to two parent homes. And I think that's kind of where the conversation went, where she's kind of like, I'd rather cater to my child than a husband. I, something to that effect. So, but anyway, you get a chance to check it out. I just wanted to know what you thought about it because mm-hmm. it could be interesting, just a topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think mm-hmm. um, just in like culturally and the single parent household and everything there, it brings up a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, and I know there's just, 
there is a lot of trauma in that alone. And like, I could go a whole thing talking about black family and all these things and like what didn't happen. Um, but, and just the impact of like some of the things that have happened gener generationally um, and culturally for us and, you know, the things that it kind of leaves us with today. Um, but I think there's a lot of, there, there's, a, so there's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of pain, I think on, on just, when you look over time, over the past century or so, just what has happened to the Black family and like Black households and like the impact that has generation after generation after generation and what we're left with mm. and being able to, when, when you see it from that lens, it's kind of like, okay, this isn't all just coming out of nowhere, yeah. right? This is coming from this intergenerational pain and trauma that exists that leaves with a lot of unanswered questions about how do we begin to repair the black family how do we begin to repair just the view of ourselves living in this world and it's yeah it could be I could go a whole <laughs> so um, so what I hear you saying is you you gonna come back yeah okay, okay. <laughs> yeah that's what I hear you saying okay I just wanted to make sure to get that on public, you know, get that out there. So that way uh, I had to hold you to your word. I got you. <laughs> From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Mm. Oh, the importance of team. Like my parents work very much as a team, mm. um, even today. Um, just seeing them interact. My parents are not perfect by any means, <laughs> but they they show me just the impor the importance of working together. And they're very much, um, you know, and I see them interact. I see them having conversations. I see them trying to problem solve together. And like the, their ability to be able to come together, even if they don't always get along because they've been married for almost 30 some years, they got over each other's nerves. But, you know, it really showed me this, the importance of a team and just being able to work together and problem solve together. And that's something that, you know, I look for for myself in relationship is the ability to come together, to be a team, to um, all with the the end goal of, you know, maintaining this family and being able to carry on this family unit and legacy and everything that they are trying to do. And so I, that's definitely something that I've picked up on from them that um, has become a big value for me. Mm -hmm. Love it. Last question. There's no right or wrong answer. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Ooh, you're asking these hard hitting questions. Man, I feel like, hold on, wait. <laughs> Let me think about this one. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Hmm. I think it would depend on the person, right? Because when I think about that, the person who might be struggling with their own self esteem or their own beliefs about self might find it easier to love somebody else, right? And then, you know, the person who, you know, is, is all about themselves, they, yeah, it might be harder for them to love other people. Mm. So it, it really does depend, but I think, you know, ultimately, And also I've said, I've had a lot of thought about this too on just what does it even mean to love yourself? Mm. Like, what does that even mean? And I had this um I had like a year where I was like, you know, everybody always talking about love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. I'm like, what does that even mean? I was just like, what are, what are we really saying? And like, and even just in my own reflection of thinking about what does that even mean like for myself and you know, I think it really, for me, it just comes down to 
how much attention am I giving myself? How much am I really paying attention to what I need? And am I able to provide that for myself? And how do I keep my promises to myself? Do I, when I say I'm gonna do something, do I do it? Like that, it's like, okay, how much am I caring for myself? How much am I showing up? How often do I betray myself? How often do I abandon myself? Yes. And I don't want to cut you off, but that is so good. I just want to say this real quick because I was reading something not too long ago and they talked about how do you betray yourself? Do you keep your word to yourself? And by not following through, that's the beginning of low self-confidence and not valuing yourself and not prioritizing yourself because it's this internal battle that I can't even follow through on my own promises. You know, it's this internal struggle. So when I heard you say that, I was like, that's that's real. Like keeping your word to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, you know, and we expect that from other people, right? Yeah. Like we should yeah. relationship with what, what I didn't say, what they, uh, they didn't uh, do what they said they was gonna do. Okay, they're being inconsistent. I was like, okay, are you consistent with yourself? Like, you know, like, back that, like, like, how are we showing up for ourselves and how are we truly being intentional with ourselves the way we want to be loved by somebody else? And, you know, are we seeking that solely from someone else or are we also giving that to ourselves too? But not to say that, like, you know, because people get, people will desire romantic connection. And it gets to a point where, okay, I can't love myself out of not wanting that, right? And, you know, people are like, you know, you should just, you know, be by yourself, love yourself more. And it's like, look, I want a relationship. Like, I don't want to be by myself. And so, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with with wanting romantic connection and wanting romantic love, right? Like, we, we can't really just give that to ourselves. So I want to just clarify that, but we can love ourselves to the fullness we can provide for ourselves in a sense of emotional and mental wellness and we can be intentional on how we are showing up and keeping promises to ourselves and the more that we're able to walk in that and have a higher self-esteem it might change what we are now attracted to what we deal with in a relationship so it all really does come full circle, but you know, it all, but it does start with us. It starts with how are we seeing ourselves? Mm-hmm. How, what do we feel like belongs to us? And how can we continue to affirm, show up, care, nurture ourselves and not neglect, betray, abandon ourselves and change the pattern of things that we've experienced, you know, in childhood or in past relationships and saying, you know what, I'm ready to step into something different, but it starts with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Change started with me. Um, I, I can't let you get away without answering this question though. Okay. (laughs) Because you gave me both perspectives of, is it easier to love yourself or someone else? But for Tierra, is it easier to love someone or love yourself? Listen, <laughs> listen. Why are you throwing these at me like this? You just okay, okay, okay. <sighs> In There's my no wrong answer. Day to day, today I say it's easier to love myself than others. Old me, I would have definitely. It definitely would have been the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I got to ask you one more thing. <laughs> you throwing them. You throwing them. You throwing them. <laughs> you keep setting me up, so I have to knock them down. Mm-hmm. What was the turning point for you to make you fall in love with yourself? Is the, can you remember a time where you was like, "I choose me now"? Like, what was mm-hmm. that? What was that? When was that turning point? Do you remember was there a specific time or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, we had my divorce. That was my divorce. It was 2020. And 
you know, it was it was a very tumultuous time between like the end of 2019 and 2020. It was just, there was a lot going on inside the marriage and just within inside myself. Mm-hmm. And it was when I was getting to a place of I'm ready to just let go in a way of like, okay, I can't keep going the way I've been going where I'm just like, where everything is all about this person. I'm I'm in pain and I'm like, okay. And then when I prayed to God and I was like, God, I just want your perfect will for my life. Not, okay, God, restore my marriage. Like, make it, I just, I just want this thing to work. Like I had been praying. But I said, God, I just want your perfect will for my life. After that, everything changed. Everything fell apart. Everything, everything, when I say everything fell apart, stuff with that, I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and um, and then, yeah, you know, and, you know, divorce happened. You know, I didn't want the divorce, but I was like, okay, God, I don't know what's happening. I just, but I trust you. I don't know the plan, but I know you have a plan and I'm going to lean on that. And so, you know, and I moved back home and I was like, all right, I'm finally going to take this time to heal from all of it and really not avoid it, not run from it like I had been doing Mm -hmm. and just, you know, acting like everything was fine. And so when I really was intentional with that time with myself and I really was really getting to know myself again and really trying to figure out who am I and without this person I've been with for so many years and who am I outside of my career outside of all of these other outside things and just getting back to the center of who Tierra is and building on that and that's when things started to change with the love that I have for myself and really being open, ready to receive whatever belongs to me mm-hmm. and being able to change the narrative around myself and what I felt like I deserved. Mm-hmm. I love it. That's that's powerful. Um yes, yeah, that's, that's powerful. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> I feel like you probably got some more stuff to say. <laughs> This is this is what I do. I you know I'm always asking questions, uh, but we'll save it for another time. I want to first of all acknowledge you for getting into the mental health field and uh, being an advocate for you know mental health. Uh, you're needed in our culture, especially today. I mean, we have the world in our hands, but yet there's so many depressed people. There's so many people that are struggling mentally, spiritually, in so many different ways. So I want to acknowledge you for getting into that field and being an agent of change. And I want to acknowledge you also for taking the step to go through your divorce, because I know how it is. I've been there. So I want to acknowledge you for taking that step of faith and knowing that on the other side of fear is faith. Uh, so. I want to acknowledge you for those things, for being brave and taking that step to do what's best for you. So I want to acknowledge you for those things. Brave Hearts community, if you haven't, follow Tierra. Make sure you go follow her on Instagram. Oh, you know what? You let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Therapy with Tia. T-I-A. And um I'm on LinkedIn, Tierra Faulkner. Um yeah, both kind of the main platforms I'm on. Um you follow me, the medium, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah, because yeah, because you have uh I was looking, I think, at your link tree and you have blog spots and everything. I was just like, man, she she doing it. Um, so yeah, so make sure you connect with her Brave Hearts community because I only bring the best on this show. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone. I'm trying to get in y'all group chats, okay? That's how you get more views. If you can get in people group chats, I found this out, Tierra. You get in the group chats, your videos can go crazy. People can start sharing your stuff because you got 
five or six of your best girlfriends and you can share the content and all the other stuff. So anyway, make sure that you share the video with a friend because you never know what someone could be going through and hit the subscribe button as well. Review on Apple Podcasts, whatever that rating is, would like to hear your honest review. By doing so, it leaves you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff? You heard it here, Brave Hearts community. This is Sean Heineman with special guests. Tara Faulkner. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. It was. And we're going to talk off air. So Brave Hearts community, take care. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video. Thank you.